Afro-Yucatecans. Um, because those two resulted in bigamy cases, uh, I can write about pages and pages and pages about them, and I have all kinds of great detail. Uh, that's relatively unusual. Most cases, <laughs> that the Afro-Yucatecans who I uncovered, I might know their name and a few little pieces of information, but not much more than that. Um, but in the course of doing research on, specifically on Mayas, I kept coming across Afro-Yucatecans who were given a variety of labels. Afro-Yucatecan is obviously a phrase or a term that I have invented. Um, terminologically, it was very hard to pin them down. Um, Spaniards, in identifying Afro-Yucatecans, used a kind of a variety of, of terms, and the terminology was, was extremely slippery. Uh, when Afro-Yucatecans are slaves, then, then they're being tagged as um, esclavo, or more often as negro, but negro literally meaning a black man or negro, a black woman is not used um, in a kind of ethno-racial way like that. It's used in Yucatan as usually as a tag to indicate that somebody is enslaved. And once that person becomes free, then they might be called a moreno, they might not be given um, any kind of uh, ethno-racial tag at all. So I had to invent this, 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 this term Afro-Yucatecans and then gradually over the years I began to collect information on individuals like Manuel Bolio and Isabel Toquero, thinking oh, maybe there's like an article in here or something and the project got bigger and bigger and bigger and then when it got so fat that I was afraid it would be too boring that people would read it and I also couldn't get it published. I had to get a subvention to include all the dull tables in the back of it. I stopped. Um, there's masses and masses of information about Afro-Yucatecans. Uh, I, I, I hope that future scholars will pick up this book, which um, Sarah mentioned at the, the beginning, it just came out last year, and use all the references to documents like this one, which is from the Archivo General de Indias in Seville. These are real Afro-Yucatecan militiamen. Um, and we'll dig up the sources I found and explore the thousands of pages of sources that I didn't get to or didn't explore thoroughly enough and there'll be future graduate students finding out all the mistakes I made. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the themes um, that I pulled out of the book and I, you know, I haven't, I've just kind of been talking in fairly general terms and I haven't talked much in detail about the thesis of the book which is pretty obviously suggested by the title, The Black Middle. And I'll be kind of brief about this, and then at the end, if there's some piece of this that you suspect is in here that's particularly of interest to you and that I have skated over or avoided completely, I can come back to talk about that. Um, so sort of a, f a few basic themes that are suggested, particularly by the stories of Bolio and Torquero. First of all, Afro-Yucatecans come into the colony as slaves. Um, obviously, their presence there is rooted in slavery, but Yucatan never becomes a slave society. It's a society with slaves, and that's a distinction that is used by North American historians in talking about African slavery in the United States. It's, it's, that sounds like a kind of uh, very untechnical um, dichotomy, a slave society or a society with slaves. There's a kind of lengthy definition that has been developed by North American historians a slave society is one in which slavery and the relationship between master and slave is a kind of elemental relationship within, the, within that society. In a society with slaves, like Yucatan, that elemental relationship is different. In Yucatan, the elemental relationship is the one between the small minority of Spanish settlers and the, and the free Maya majority. And Mayas remain overwhelming the majority. Overwhelmingly the majority in Yucatan, they perform overwhelmingly most of the labor, they are the source of what little wealth the colony generates. Um, so Yucatan remains not a slave society, but a society with slaves. However, the number of people of African descent is always about the same as the number of people of Spanish descent. So in the late 16th century, the Afro-Yucatecan population is, is, is about 0.3% maybe 0.5%. Obviously, when you're talking about the colonial period, the demographics are pretty fuzzy, right? So let's say half a percent of the population. That doesn't sound very much, but that's almost exactly the same as the Spanish population. And just because the Spaniards are the conquerors, although actually in Yucatan, it's, there are more Aztecs than Spaniards that come in to conquer the colonies. So that's a whole other complicated subject. Just because they are 
the rulers of the colony and the Africans have come in as slaves doesn't mean to say that um, those people of African descent aren't contributing to the development of a unique civilization or sub-civilization within, within Yucatan. Um, at the end of the colonial period, we look at census data from the 1790s and the Spaniards get quite heavily involved in taking censuses and demographics in the, in the final decades of the, of the colonial period. Uh, the Afro-Yucatecan population is about 12%. Now, by this point, we, it's hard to identify discrete groups of native peoples. So in Yucatan, it's Mayas and then the other Nahua speakers, Aztecs who come into Spaniards and then Africans. By the time we get to the, to the end of the colonial period, there's been a lot of miscegenation. So our Afro-Yucatecan population is overwhelmingly free. Tiny, tiny percentage of those people are, are slaves. Overwhelmingly free and overwhelmingly of mixed descent, right? Not African born. So therefore my invented category of Afro-Yucatecan is kind of deliberately vague and is able to incorporate all of those people. Um, population of Spaniards in the economy group, about the same, about 12%. But that includes some people who are mestizos, who have some Maya ancestry as well, but then the Maya majority also has people who have some African and Spanish. So it gets kind of fuzzy. So you realize that when I'm throwing out these statistics, they're not kind of sort of very scientific, but they're enough to kind of give you um, some sense of the point that I'm making. Secondly, the Afro-Yucatecan population um, is colony is colony-wide. Afro-Yucatecan spread very quickly um, through the colony. And these two maps here that are from the book, kind of different ways of illustrating that. So these, I don't know if this comes up as well. It comes up better on the book than it does on the PowerPoint. But the measles I referred to earlier, um, that roughly indicates the, the communities within the colony where there was a significant Afro-Yucatecan population. It's kind of this, uh, this crescent. Um, it, there are very few communities that have um, negligible Afro-Yucatecan populations, and there are none that I could find that have no Afro-Yucatecans at all. Uh, part of um, the phenomenon that is, is driving uh, the spread of Afro-Yucatecan population is the, is the militia system. And this little map, I have cute little um, rifles and little forts, <coughs> and the forts indicate fortifications that are built by the Spaniards to defend the colony, um, mostly from the wretched English. And down here, of course, the English are becoming more and more of a pest down in Belize, but also on the, on the coast, and especially around Campeche, which in the 17th century is repeatedly a, a, a attacked. And then the rifles indicate where militia units are stationed. But this is not a standing army. Uh, why Afro-Yucatecans become the defenders of the colony as militia and so on, I don't want to get sidetracked into talking about that. I can come back to that later, but suffice to say, it's, they're the ones who are primarily defending the colony. Um, but pi pirates aren't attacking all the time. And in the 18th century, the, if you know anything about the history of piracy, it's, it's no longer really an, an issue of pirates, it's more an issue of wars that are going on between the French and the Spanish and the English and the Caribbean, and surprise attacks uh, don't happen very often. So what are these guys doing out here while they're waiting, and there may be one or two in the lifetime of a, of a militiaman, where they're waiting for an attack, and they're supposed to then um, pick up their rifles and go rushing up off, off to the coast. They're doing um, what Mayas are doing out in the countryside. An Afro-Yucatecan uh, militiaman living in Hoktun, those men are living like Maya men. Uh, they're working cornfields, they <coughs> end up marrying Maya women and having children that speak only Maya, and they're living in houses with um, palm leaf roofs, and uh, they're, even their, their surnames, their Spanish surnames, uh, are gradually disappearing. So there's this sort of phenomenon that's going on of Afro-Yucatecans moving out to the villages. There is not a corresponding phenomenon of Maya surnames disappearing. The Spanish, even the names are being kind of sucked into the, 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 the patronym system. Um, third point I want to make here, I'm kind of 